This is cow soy, and as far as I'm concerned, it's one of the world's all-time great dishes. It's a super aromatic coconut-based noodle soup that I only had for the first time a couple years ago. And those first 30-something years of my life without cow soy in them are something I'll always regret. But over the last couple months, Sarah and I made more than two dozen batches to try and figure out what makes this dish tick, where it came from, and how it became the dish it is today. Which is surprisingly hard to pin down because there's a bunch of missing details and competing stories. Come on, whoever did this, just confess. We promise we won't be mad. Regardless, most stories start somewhere in the 1800s with the Hui people of the Yunnan province in China. Yunnan is China's most ethnically diverse province. It sits just south of Sichuan along the border of Tibet, Vietnam, Laos, and most importantly to this story, Myanmar, then known as Burma. Burma at this point is somewhere in the middle of three wars against peak Imperial Britain. It's being rapidly colonized for its convenient position between British India and China in the spice trade, and perhaps for its convenient position in an even spicier trade that Britain and China are about to fight an even bigger war over. But more importantly to our story, in Burma we find a dish called Onno Kausue, which basically translates to coconut milk noodles. Onno Kausue is basically a perfect alley-oop to Hui traders who are about to take it give me, give me, give me the ball. and evolve it into something new. Actually, I should give a little intro to the Hui. There's basically two things you need to know about them for this story. One, they're genetically identical to the Chinese majority, the Han, but they're considered a minority because they practice Islam. And two, the Hui were commonly caravan traders at this point in time, and they traveled throughout Southeast Asia plying spices and that other spicy stuff. The Hui lived in many provinces of China, but the Hui of Yunnan in particular led a rebellion against the Qing dynasty that went pretty okay at first, and then all of a sudden pretty terribly, which maybe led to Hui settling outside of China along those trade routes. One of the biggest stops on those trade routes would have been Chiang Mai, the capital of the Lan Na Kingdom. Lan Na is just coming off a victory high in their war of secession from Burma in order to join the future country of Thailand. And Thailand just put down their own rebellion in Bangkok and is about to expel a bunch of Malay Muslims to Chiang Mai too, bringing Laksa with them. So even though Chiang Mai almost certainly knew about Onno Khao Sui from their previous relationship with Burma, an influx of Hui traders from the north easy access to spices in British India to the west, and incoming Malays from the south all add together to create pretty perfect conditions for the dish we now know as cow soy to appear. Since then, every culture that gets their hands on this dish riffs on it to accommodate their own local taste and ingredients because the core idea is just that good. In addition to Onno cow soy and Chiang Mai style cow soy, there's also Pakistani kausa, there's Indian and Myanmar kousui, kousui? I'm trying. There are multiple other regional variants in Thailand, and then there's Lao Khao Soi, which is just a whole other thing entirely. And the version we came up with is mindful of where the dish comes from, but also riffs on it again to accommodate local taste and ingredients. And you should try it, because it's fucking delicious. Khao Soi literally translates to rice noodles, and I found references to early vendors actually making turmeric colored rice noodles and steaming those above the boiling soup. I have no idea how common those were, but today most vendors are selling noodles of the egg variety, which are conveniently yellow and probably a lot easier to buy. We tested a bunch of different noodle types for our recipe. Everything from Chinese straight wheat noodles to rice stick to pad thai style flat rice noodles to spaghetti and fettuccine. Honestly, use whatever noodles you have and you're probably gonna have a good time. Easy, you can do it with rice the noodles, noodles you can do it with fettuccine. Yeah. I don't think the noodles are like- It's not making a difference at all. The deal breaker. Coconut milk is the consistent ingredient across basically every version except for Laos's, which is, again, pretty different. It's brothy and tomato-based, so we're gonna stick with coconut milk for this one. There's actually a huge variety even within the coconut contingent. Pakistani Khausa actually calls for two stews on top of noodles, but my personal favorite is just simple coconut milk because it kind of gives the texture of like a classic Thai curry. Now we need to flavor that coconut milk with something. Across the board that we found that shallots or onions, ginger and garlic were par for the course, often charred to give them a smoky edge. Some recipes add additional aromatics like lemongrass, makrut lime leaf or galangal, but we erred on the side of simplicity here because we're already gonna have a lot of flavor in this bowl. Key spices for the Chiang Mai style, our primary influence, are black cardamom, coriander and turmeric. The turmeric, as always, is just there for color. And that's actually pretty important here because without it, this soup is pretty ugly. The coriander is just doing its thing and bringing some citrusy brightness, but the most important ingredient, and unfortunately the trickiest to find in a lot of the US, is black cardamom, which has a slightly medicinal flavor and brings a subtle smokiness as well due to its drying method. To make it even harder to find, there are actually two spices that go by this name, although luckily we're dealing with the more common of the two here. If you find a jar labeled black cardamom in your grocery store, that's probably the one you want. If you need to look online, I'd recommend searching by one of its Chinese names, Cao Guo, which should be a convenient way for you to find the right thing. To round out the spice mix, we tucked in a little bit of cinnamon to smooth off that medicinal edge and some chili flakes for additional heat. 
Both are optional, but we like them. Then traditionally you're gonna pound the shit out of everything in a giant granite mortar and pestle until it's smooth like a curry paste. I've done that many times, but we're not gonna do that here. Instead, I'm gonna steal a trick from Hong Tai Mi's book, True Thai, where she recommends a blender as an alternative. Why are we gonna do that? Well, we did a side-by-side -side blind taste test of both the blender version and the mortar and pestle version and found that both the texture and the flavor of the blender version were better. Honestly, I was shocked, but I promise you, it's genuinely better this way. The important thing is just to let it blend until it's completely smooth. This takes about 90 seconds at top speed in a Vitamix, but would probably take a bit longer in lower power blenders. Either way, that's nothing compared to the 20 to 30 minutes it would take in a mortar and pestle. Since this is a dish that has been fostered by Muslim communities, we're looking at either chicken or beef, since pork is haram. We prefer chicken because we found that beef takes way longer to reach full tenderness, and honestly just doesn't taste as good to us in this dish. I mean, it's good. Real fatty. It took four hours. We use whole chicken legs, which is a pretty typical approach and makes for a pretty nice presentation. But honestly, a boneless, skinless chicken thigh would probably be easier to eat. If you're looking for a vegan approach, we also found that oyster mushrooms make for a pretty good substitution. I like this. I like this a lot. The technique here is simple. Sear off our protein, then deglaze with that blender full of coconut milk. Just make sure you have the heat off first. Most recipes call for this chicken just to be cooked through, but instead we chuck it in the oven for a 90 minute braise to make sure that it's fall off the bone tender. We find that way easier to eat with chopsticks and we think you will too. Chicken just pulled right nice, off. Nice crispy skin, but like yeah. the tender meat underneath. After 90 minutes, we'll set the chicken aside and move the soup back to the stove top to boost the flavor with salt and sugar. First, be careful, that handle's gonna be fucking hot and I've got the burns to prove it. If you're grabbing a 300 degree pan with a towel, make sure that towel is dry. Did I know that? Yes. Did I do it? No. Salt for this dish often comes from shrimp paste, but in our case, it's gonna come from fish sauce because that's easier to season with at the end of the cooking process. Fish sauces, like soy sauces, are pretty different from country to country, so we'd recommend choosing a Thai option if available. Oyster brand, squid brand, and healthy boy are all pretty widely available online. If you're making a vegan version, vegan fish sauce is probably fine. Otherwise, I tried Thai thin soy sauce, which was okay, but gave it a bit of a Japanese curry hint to my taste buds. If you use garam masala and soy sauce together, you just end up with something that tastes a lot like Japanese curry rather than cow soy. Learnings. As always, we're seasoning to taste. Pour some in, stir it around, actually taste it, then repeat as necessary. Just over the edge to where you can taste the fishy funk and not just the salt, that's where it hits for me. Palm sugar is the sugar of choice and it comes in these little 15 gram discs. You can chuck a whole one in and it'll take a few minutes of simmering to dissolve or you can grind it down with a knife first and it'll dissolve almost instantly. Cane sugar will also work fine but it doesn't have quite the same richness to it. Most of the time my soup's gonna be too thick by now and it's only gonna get thicker once the noodles start slurping up some of the soup. Add a little water to thin it out to your preference and taste the seasoning again once it's diluted. Adding water to the dishes is low risk because you can always turn up the heat and reduce it again if you feel like you've added too much. Now we've got a bowl of noodles smothered in an aromatic, savory, slightly sweet coconut soup. And we need to round out the flavor profile and give it some textural contrast. Every culture solves for these problems in different ways, but generally speaking, you're gonna want something crunchy, something sour, something herbaceous, and something spicy. For the crunch, we're skipping Chiang Mai's fried noodle approach because they get soggy too fast. Instead, we'll use Myanmar's solution, chopped peanuts. They never quite have the same crisp up front, but they never lose the crunch factor either. Plus they taste like peanuts and that's pretty good. For sour, there's almost always a lemon or lime wedge on the side to squeeze in. At one point I thought I'd whip up some lime pickled shallots because they're my two favorite things. One, easy, and two, fucking delicious. In my opinion, that turned out to be a stroke of genius because instead of the lime juice dispersing evenly throughout the soup and every bite tasting the same, now you have it concentrated inside the shallot pieces and you get different amounts in different bites and each bite becomes slightly different. The other sour ingredient we pulled straight from the Chiang Mai playbook is Swan Tsai, pickled Chinese mustard greens. It's absolutely core to the flavor of cow soy for us, so we tested a bunch of brands and we also fermented our own. Ultimately, we couldn't agree on what we liked best. The homemade version has more of a lactic flavor, kind of like a deli pickle. The store-bought stuff, on the other hand, tends to use a mix of acetic acid, benzoic acid, and citric acid, which give it some pretty different and unique flavors. Oh, just putting it in there, I'm just like in love. They're all delicious and work great with this dish, just make sure you get mustard greens and not mustard tubers. For our herb component, we usually go with cilantro, but if you're not into that, you could also use mint and green onion, like Pakistani kausa, which was dope. I bet Thai basil would also be good here. Finally, we need some heat, and honestly, chili crisp is a great move here. Just choose whichever one you like. Our favorite for this dish is boon, but it's our favorite for most dishes because it's pretty neutral and has a little boost of umami on top of the heat. With a little boom, we're in good shape. And that's it. As always, we name each of our recipes with a pun on a celebrity name because SEO optimized recipe names and list of ingredients aren't any fun. This one is called Term Robinson. Red!
and um... I'm sorry. Go make some soup. Do you want my soup? Not that soup. That soup looks cold as shit. Yeah, it, it is cold. These noodles have been sitting here for so long. Mm -hmm. But the chicken is also cold. Yeah. It's tender though. That's what's important. Watch out for your shirt too. Put it in splatter. It's turmeric colored for a reason. I'm gonna heat up the rest of it. I need a whole bowl of this. A real bowl, not a prop bowl. Fall in love with the soup all over again. And it's cold. Yeah, is it good cold? It's kind of good cold. I don't think these noodles are good cold. Like, everything else is great cold, though. Okay. 